as he had each day since he had overthrown the previous ruler. Lord Raban stood upon the battlements of the Imperial Fortress and looked down upon his toiling serfs. Dagarthi was a backwater planet, but for him it provided a good life. His army enforced the rules, the workers slaved away, and the tithes were paid. If Lord Raban gave any thought to the untold millions that slaved away under his imposed misery, it was with a satisfied feeling. As he had been taught, it was the right of the strong to rule, and Lord Raban knew he was strong. Leaving the ramparts, the Lord entered the tower and walked down the corridor towards his harem. He was caught up in his own thoughts, so that he did not notice the missing guards. Lit only by black iron braziers, the hall was dark, but not so dark that Lord Raban could miss the sudden shift in the shadows behind him. Reacting with a speed unattainable by a non-augmented man, he spun, lashing out his fist, yet the blow never landed. It had been a long time since Raban had faced an opponent that could move as quickly as himself, and his robed assailant blocked each strike like he knew it was coming. Worse still, by the clanging his fists were making, his foe was wearing some form of power armor beneath his robes. So it was not an Imperial assassin, or a local Dagathi bounty hunter, yet there was little more time for thought as they grappled in the dark. It did not take Raban long to realize he was overmatched in such a contest. If he had any space, he could step back and draw forth his blade, a monomolecular edge power weapon that would penetrate any armor. Raban struggled to give himself room to draw his weapon. This was just what his foe had been waiting for, and his attacker unleashed a flurry of pummeling blows. Raban spat out teeth, desperate enough now to call for guards when he felt something jab into his neck. A jolt of current entered his body, paralyzing him almost instantly. His next thought was that the stone floor was cold, and that there was blood in his mouth. How long he had been out, Raban did not know. Not long, he guessed. Above him, the stranger pulled forth some device from within his robes. It unfolded like a small porter rack. It was a device that Raban had not seen for ages, and a chill ran through his body. At last, he knew his foe. The startle of his terror released a desperate surge as Raban lurched upwards using all his strength fighting the invisible tendrils that bound his limbs. The hooded figure leaned over him so that, at last, he could see the face. It was older and more haunted than he remembered. Greetings, Ramel, said a voice that was little more than a rasping whisper. The use of his old name was like some accusation. It sent further waves of terror through Raban's mind. He panicked, struggling hard against unseen bonds while leads and clamps were attached cruelly to his head. While he worked, Cypher spoke again. The Dark Angels are coming. This mind wipe will remove what I cannot let you reveal. I could remove everything, of course, but I will leave you the full ability to feel. I think you've earned that. It was the last thing Raban remembered until he woke up in twisting agony. He was bound, and an interrogator chaplain was inches from his face. Raban could see his own pale reflection in the inhuman lenses of that skull-like helm. I thought that might wake you, said the black armored space marine. Welcome to the rock, heretic. More pain awaits you if you cannot answer my questions. We shall begin with you telling me your true name. Raban, who had long ago been Ramil, attempted to speak, but found himself unable. Try as he might, he could only scream. Greetings, friends, and welcome to the Imperium's Most Wanted. I'm Lorcan, and this is only war. There is one whom the Masters of the First Legion seek above all others. He is a figure wrapped in shadow, an entity whose every move is shrouded in mystery. His moves and methods are themselves an enigma. Even the name by which he is known seems to hide a deeper meaning. He is Cypher, and to the Dark Angels he is a pain for a reminder of their shame, and remains their most hated foe. Yet in his pursuit, and through his actions, they have achieved many great victories. 
During the horror and bloodshed of the Horus Heresy, the fall of Caliban was one of the last major catastrophes suffered by the Imperium. Since those dark days when the galaxy burned, Cypher has been on the run, eluding capture for nearly 10,000 years. During that time, Cypher has been reported in each of the five segmentums, appearing as if from nowhere to haunt the minds of his former brothers. Wherever he goes, death and destruction follows, although whether he is the culprit or merely a herald of woe is often unclear. Although the accounts are too often tainted with bias, it appears that Cypher seldom instigates the carnage that invariably occurs when he is present. Rather that he seems to act as a catalyst, which fans the flames of hatred and mistrust of those around him into a raging inferno. In each case, Cypher vanishes from the scene as abruptly as he arrived. Worlds burn in his wake, yet he leaves little clue as to where he would turn up next. Besides havoc and ruin, there is another trail that Cypher leaves behind. Legend and rumor abound after the passage of the mysterious robed figure. The intrigue over his rapid departure further magnified by the inevitable wave of ensuing questions. What motivates the mysterious cloaked figure? Why does he stoke the flames of rebellion on some worlds, while in others he delivers swift retribution worthy of the Emperor's finest servants? Is he truly deserving of the hatred his former brothers bear him, or do his actions aid them and the Imperium in the only way he knows they will accept, lurking in the shadows under a veil of heresy and deceit? In this first part, we will take the story from the first known man to bear the title on Caliban, the two known successors, and then through to the events in the 41st millennium that caused the death of the Dark Angel's homeworld ten millennia earlier. Before we delve deeper into this mysterious figure, a quick thank you to my patient supporters on Patreon, and those who have subscribed and commented over the time I've been away, dealing with a whole host of life changes. They really do mean the world to me. As always, if you're new here, thank you for joining us and giving me the time to tell you a tale or two. I truly hope I earn your subscription today. The story of Cypher begins well before the Imperium and the Great Crusade came to the Dark Angel's home world of Caliban, before there was even the first talk of angels. Terror was little more than a myth, an ephemeral and half-forgotten place. It was the time of old night. Warp storms had made it impossible to travel between the stars, and each human world was left alone in the dark to fend for itself. Caliban had spent 5,000 years in isolation from the rest of humanity, time enough for its people to diverge on their own path. A culture, drawing from the patterns of the past, but separate from what had gone before, free from the influence of terror their society beliefs, and customs were moulded by their forested home. Except for isolated islands cleared for settlement and agriculture, Caliban was covered in a primordial, shadow-haunted woodland, and it was the domain of monsters. The forests contained all manner of hazards and teemed with predatory species. In the lexicon of imperial cartography, Caliban was classified as a death world. There were not many of the indigenous life forms found there that were not capable of causing a man an untimely demise. Carnivorous animals, plants laden with toxins, venomous insects. The creatures of this world only knew one law, and it was kill or be killed. Nature red in tooth and claw. Of all the dangers to human life, there was one class of creatures that was always viewed as being set apart. They were more fearsome and terrifying than any other animal the human population knew. These creatures were simply called the Great Beasts. Each one was unique, representing the only example of its kind. Their diversity was extraordinary. An individual beast might appear to be modeled after a reptile, a mammal, or an insect, or else a horrific chimera combining the features of all of them in a chaotic collaboration. If they had one dominant feature, it was that every one of them appeared to be crafted directly from the stuff of nightmares, the terrors that lurk in the deep subconscious mind made flesh. The dominance of these great beasts helped shape the feudal society that arose on Caliban. 
The nobility formed knightly orders that trained warriors to levels of exemplary skill and armed them to the highest standards to protect the populace from the predations of the monsters that prowled the dark forests. While most of the technology brought to Caliban by their ancient colonist ancestors was long lost, the knowledge of how to repair and maintain primitive versions of bolt pistols, chain swords, and even rudimentary power armor aided the knights, who rode selectively bred war horses called Desterias into battle. In due course, the knightly orders went on to construct great fortress monasteries. Whenever one of the beasts began to prey on a settlement, a hunting quest against the creature would be declared. In response, knights and knights supplicant would come to the area from every land, seeking to prove themselves by killing the beast and completing the quest. This was the pattern of life on Caliban for countless generations. Some time before the Emperor came to Caliban, a new knightly order had been founded. It called itself simply the Order, and its members put forward the startling proposition that all men were created equal. Traditionally, knights were recruited strictly from amongst the nobility, but the order broke with accepted practice to recruit from all layers of society. If an individual proved worthy through his deeds and character, the order didn't care if he was a commoner or of noble birth. This philosophy caused tensions with some of the more established orders, but when the order were victorious in a conflict with the knights of the Crimson Chalice, who besieged their fortress at Alderuk, Supplicants flocked to them, and they soon became one of the most powerful and well-regarded knightly orders. But even greater change was to come, in the form of a man-child found living wild in the deep forests. Speaking not a word of human language how this handsome stranger had survived for years, naked and unarmed, in one of the most dangerous regions of Caliban, was a mystery. The wild man became known as Lion L. Johnson, meaning the lion, the son of the forest, in the old tongue of Caliban. Johnson soon demonstrated the prodigious talents of a Primarch, quickly assimilating into human society, and within a few short months, he was the equal of the greatest scholars on Caliban. His intellectual capacity was matched only by his physical power. None could match his strength or prowess in combat, and he swiftly mastered the skills of knighthood to be accepted into the Order. Johnson rapidly ascended through the Order's ranks, his achievements legendary, and coupled with a natural talent to inspire intense devotion in others, yet more recruits flocked to the Order. Johnson and his supporters started to press for a crusade to be mounted against the Great Beasts. Their proposal called for a systematic campaign to clear the beasts from the forests, region by region, until Caliban was finally free from their scourge. While the Order was the dominant military power on Caliban, it was still only first among equals in the eyes of the other knightly orders, who had always been inclined to feud amongst themselves. Johnson had envisaged the span of six years from the beginning of his war against the beasts to victory, but even his allies thought that was not enough time to achieve the plan's objectives. One by one, the beasts were hunted down and killed. They were driven from the forests. They were tracked to their lairs and destroyed. Through it all, he was supported by Luther, the man who found Johnson in the forest and gave him his name, the man who brought him to civilization and taught him the ways of society. As Johnson's actions began to change the face of Caliban, Luther kept stride with him, equaling the wild man's accomplishments with his own. While the two of them shared many victories, it was always Johnson who was lauded for these triumphs. Some say Luther grew increasingly bitter at being so much in the lion's shadow. They say a secret seed of anger was born in Luther's heart in those days, the seed of future hatreds. By the tenth year of Johnson's campaign against the great beasts, nearly all had been killed, with only a few remaining in the most inhospitable regions of the planet. A golden age appeared to beckon, and then the Emperor came to reunite with his son, and bring Caliban into the wider Imperium. As with most details about the current cipher, it is difficult to pinpoint with any convictions his origins, but the title of Lord Cipher can be traced back to these days on Caliban. Long before the coming of the Primarch, the lordly designation was given to a single knight of the Order. The Order was austere, with many rituals simple but exacting. 
In their view, the most important function of ritual and tradition was to create stability and balance the inner world of the mind and create a sense of social cohesion. To ensure they were maintained, the ruling masters secretly selected a single member, the Lord Cypher. Though not as ancient as many of the other knightly orders of Caliban, it accumulated an impressive array of customs in the course of its history. Upon taking the title, the Lord Cypher renounced his own name, enshrouding his very appearance behind cloak and hood. It was forbidden to know the original name of the knight that was appointed to the position, although he held many other names. The Master of Mysteries, Keeper of the Truth, the Lord of Keys. The Lord Cypher advised the Masters on all matters of protocol and officiated at many important ceremonies. It was a lofty position, one which the Order took extremely seriously. Although many preceded him in bearing the title, the first Lord Cypher we have on record was the one holding the position before the Lion became the Grand Master of the Order. This Lord Cypher was an old man that many of the younger supplicants felt was well past his prime. This venerable Lord Cypher felt able to chide both Luther and the Lion when he felt the sombre ceremonies of the Order were not being upheld. He saw no more important matter than the initiation of a new supplicant, when the young man had yet to take his oaths to protect the peoples of Caliban, abide by the rules and strictures of the Order, and most importantly for the Legion they would become, keep their secrets. This venerable Lord Cypher held his position for over 20 years at the time of the Lion becoming Grand Master of the Order. While it was one of the most senior positions within the Order, it held very little real power. In many ways, the role as guardian of the Order's tradition was symbolic, although his counsel was always valued by those in command. Even Lionel Johnson, whose views on the values of tradition often veered from those who had preceded him. By this time, only the dense, tangled, and lethal forests of the Dark North Wilds remained to be purged of the Great Beasts. The Crusade had not yet ventured into the North Wilds, as it was vehemently opposed by the knightly order that resided there, the Knights of Lupus. They were a knightly brotherhood known for their scholars and great libraries. The Knights of Lupus had refused to go with the will of the majority once the matter had been decided, and had withdrawn to their mountain fastness in the wildlands. Before Johnson ascended to become Grand Master and Luther his second in command, the Venerable Lord Cypher retired from his duties, leaving Johnson to choose a successor. When a quest was declared against another beast in the North Wilds, the ex-Lord Cypher would petition the Order's hierarchy to be allowed to take on the quest. The old man rode quietly from Alderuk early one morning, and was never seen again. Following the siege of the Knights of Lupus Fortress, when a number of caged beasts were unleashed against the Order, and the defeat of their master Lord Sartana, the campaign was soon over, and Lionel Johnson ascended to the position of Grand Master. He appointed a new Lord Cypher, though his identity was even more of a mystery than usual. This Lord Cypher would be present with the Lion when the Imperium came to Caliban in an event known as the Descent of Angels. The glory of the Imperium and the Emperor became the most oft-told stories of Caliban, supplanting more ancient myths and tales in the space it took to tell them. Much was learned in these days beyond the histories lost to the people of Caliban over the thousands of years they had been separated from Terra. Technology and advances of science were shared freely, and the people embraced them with vigour. Freed from the tyranny of the beasts, the people of Caliban had the leisure to devote their attentions to the betterment of their society. Utilising the technology brought by the Imperium to clear vast tracts of land for agriculture, open rich seams in the mountains to produce stronger metals, build more efficient manufacturing facilities, and lift themselves from the Dark Age. The Astartes were welcomed by the general populace as the ultimate embodiment of the knightly orders. However, unlike them, the legions were united in purpose and will. Division was not tolerated, and at the behest of the Lion and the Astartes, the knightly orders were disbanded. Astartes' trials commenced, and Imperial recruiters spread throughout the planet's population, offering the chance to journey from Caliban and fight in the Emperor's armies on a thousand different worlds. While there were dissenting voices, most accepted this as part of the Imperium. 
One such voice was that of Lord Cypher, newly appointed by the Lion himself, believing the traditions he was tasked to uphold were being eroded. Others from the former knightly orders plotted against the coming of the Imperium, devising a treacherous scheme to assassinate the Emperor on his arrival, a plot that was ultimately foiled, and the newly named Dark Angels would join the Great Crusade, and under the Lion's inspired leadership, achieve a great many victories. However, after a campaign known as the Pacification of Sorosh, and the defeat of the warp-tainted entity that had enslaved the human population there, a decree from the Lion would change the course of his legion. With the Great Crusade entering a new and vigorous stage, the flow of new recruits from Caliban was not proceeding as swiftly as he had hoped. Experienced Astartes were to return to the homeworld to ensure that the recruitment of new warriors was put back on track. Though there was no outward stigma attached to their departure from the fleet, the rejection was keenly felt by every warrior selected to return to Caliban. Most surprisingly, Luther was to be amongst them. Some suggested a falling out between Johnson and Luther over the near disaster at Sarosh, of old jealousies and petty enmities rising to the fore. Others speculated Luther and the rest bore the blame for allowing a Saroshi bomb aboard the Invincible Reason. Whatever the Primarch's true reason, the return of Luther and the others to Caliban in the 147th year of the Great Crusade was apparently met with a faint glimmer of amusement by Lord Cypher. It is said that the new Lord Cypher had been trained in one of the Order's lesser fortresses, near the beast-haunted Northwilds, and even that was little more than a rumour. No one could fathom Johnson's decision, but no one had found cause to complain about it either. By all accounts, the current Cypher was more of a reclusive, scholarly figure than the previous bearers of the title, spending long hours poring through the libraries and record vaults hidden within the castle, although the paired pistols at his belt hinted he was a capable fighter. With Luther knowing in his heart that he and his brothers had fallen from the Primarch's grace, never to rejoin the Great Crusade, Lord Cypher would start his campaign of exerting subtle influence over the Lord of Caliban. As years lengthened to decades, Luther and the other exiles appeared entirely banished from their Primarch's thoughts, becoming little more than a cautionary tale to the new initiates. In the 200th year of the Great Crusade at Gordia IV, Lionel Johnson would receive word of War Master Horace's betrayal, and that Angron's World Eaters, Mortarion's Death Guard, and Fulgrim's Emperor's Children had joined him in renouncing their oaths of allegiance to the Emperor. They had virus-bombed Istvan III, with an estimated 12 billion lives being lost, and the Emperor had begun assembling a punitive force of seven legions, led by Ferris Manus and the Iron Hands, to confront the rebel legions on Istvan V and take Horus into custody. Back on Caliban, Luther's planet-wide recruiting efforts continued to show a steady increase in new aspirants, and his screening model had drastically reduced incidents of organ reject among inductees. The manufacturums on Caliban were also working efficiently, as were the recruitment and training efforts of the Imperial Army. Johnson never returned to Caliban, and in his absence the Astartes' loyalty to Luther increased, as he shared their burdens and praised their successes. Events on Caliban, however, would soon drive Luther to cancel deployments off-world, reports of unrest and sabotage over several months, causing him to draw on their emergency stockpiles to make up the shortfall. Caliban's constabulary, the upper echelons of which were filled from warriors of the now defunct knightly orders and their descendants, proved ineffective at uncovering their agitators, and Luther turned to Lord Cypher to root out the rebel leaders, a task he quickly achieved. Defiance of Imperial law demanded swift and ruthless action, without mercy or compromise, but with the insurrection spreading across Caliban, Luther agreed to allow Lord Cypher to set up a meeting with their leaders. The four rebel leaders urged Luther to embrace his destiny and turn his back on the Primarch who had banished him. It seemed they had been given some indication from Lord Cypher that Luther would consider their proposal, but he rejected their advances. The violence escalated, forcing lockdowns, particularly in the Northwild's archaeology, 
Yet Luther refused to unleash the Astartes on his own people, and began secluding himself in the Strategium in Alderuk for days on end, only allowing Lord Cypher to give him counsel. Events at the materials processing plant designated Sigma 517 forced the Master of Caliban's hand, and would lead to the discovery of a taint that was inexplicably part of Caliban itself. The squad of veterans sent by Luther included the librarian Zahareo and a Terran named Astalan. They encountered Reva Worms and their tainted queen in the chamber of the plant's thermal core, corpses of the plant's laborers and the Jaeger relief force animating and assailing the Astartes. Once they were defeated, a symbol comprised of hundreds of tiny runes was revealed, painted on the side of a thermal unit, an enormous serpent eating its own tail, the Ouroboros. What they discovered required great secrecy, but in a show of his increasing influence, Lord Cypher was allowed to remain, as Chief Librarian Istrafael was summoned. Zaharel gave his grim assessment. Caliban was tainted. Terran engineers sent from the site of the Northwild's arcology were held responsible, but whatever sorcerers were hidden amongst their numbers were long gone before the Astartes were deployed. Despite Istrafil's objections, Luther made it clear that whatever action would need to be taken, the events must be kept secret from both the Primarch and the Adeptus Terra, or Caliban would be doomed. Again, it was clear Lord Cypher's influence over Luther was growing. Luther would go into seclusion again, with only Lord Cypher being allowed to see the Master of Caliban. Zaharel petitioned for permission to send the Legion into the Northwild's arcology, but to no avail. Frustrated, Zaharel would go on to consult with the mysterious Watchers in the Dark about the nature of the corruption at the heart of their home world, and challenge the strange beings to reveal what they knew. The Watchers admitted they were part of a larger cabal, dedicated to battling the most ancient of evils, one that was awakening in the Northwilds. Zaharel would seek out Lord Cypher to arrange a second meeting with the rebel leaders, this time inside the Northwilds' arcology. With Caliban facing the threat of Exterminatus, Zaharel urged a truce and aid in fighting the corrupted Terran sorcerers. With thousands dying every day in the lockdown Northwilds, the Terrans would have all the psychic energy they needed to begin a large-scale version of their ritual. On their journey back to Alderuk, one of the rebel leaders, a former knight named Sardaviel, revealed to Zaharel that he had learned of the taint long ago in the tomes contained in the library of the Knights of Lupus. He also revealed he had tracked down the last surviving members of that order. Of the five that remained, only one was still alive. He had never stayed in one place for too long, passing like a ghost from one village to another. No one could remember for certain what he looked like, and he wore a great many names over the years. But just as Daviel was closing in, he discovered the former Knight of Lupus had presented himself to a brother Knight of the Order, who was passing through the village in search of new aspirants. With his skills and experience, he rose through the ranks rapidly. A cold realization dawned on Zaharel, although he struggled to believe why Lionel Johnson would allow it. The young, unknown Knight, elevated to the new Lord Cypher, entrusted with all their traditions and secrets was the last surviving Knight of Lupus. On their return to Alderuk, Lord Cypher again tried to prevent anyone seeing Luther, but when Astalan reports that the dead are rising in the Northwild's arcology, Zatharel would be denied no longer. He turned on the Master of Mysteries and sent a probe of psychic energy into his mind, demanding to be taken to Luther. Cypher attempted to resist the psychic onslaught, but finally he could take no more and agreed to take them. He led them deep into the bowels of the fortress, down secret stairways and dimly lit passages, until he reached a set of adamantium doors that he opened with a sophisticated electronic key. Within there was a library, its packed shelves rising on eight sides to a vaulted ceiling fifty meters overhead. Luther was seated near the center of the room, his eyes sunken and his cheeks hollowed. There were dark ink marks on his hands, wrists, and throat, symbols laid out in a geometric pattern. The Master of Caliban protested against their presence, and revealed the depths of his belief that the Lion had known all along that the Imperium would destroy Caliban. 
when Brother Librarian Istrafail declared Luther unfit for command and was forced to unleash a torrent of crackling energy upon him, the wards on his skin flared into life, protecting him from harm. With a single word, Luther sent the Terran Librarian reeling, but it was Lord Cypher that immediately fired a searing bolt of plasma into the chest of the Librarian, and only the intervention of Luther prevented him finishing the gravely wounded Astartes. Luther would make moves to secure all elements on Caliban that might oppose him, and declared it a free world once more before turning his attentions to the Northwilds. All the while, Lord Cypher was always close at hand, as the saviour of Caliban continued to delve into the forbidden knowledge contained in the ancient grimoires of the Knights of Lupus. It would be Lord Cypher who would suggest Zaharel could lead Luther to the sorceress through the turbulence in the warp their ritual was generating. Zaharel knew the risks, but the urgency of their situation caused him to acquiesce. When Luther led the command squad towards the ritual chamber, Lord Cypher brought a leather-bound grimoire that the Master of Caliban intended to use, not to drive the entity back, but to subjugate it. Fighting their way through a mass of corpses controlled by half a dozen Reaver worms to reach the perimeter of the ritual circle where the Terran sorcerers were focusing the building arcane energy, at its centre, Zaharel could make out massive coils of scaly hide, larger by far than any queen worm. Whatever Cypher and Luther's original plan, the Summering Ritual failed, and the coiled Leviathan returned to that dark place from which it had been summoned. The bridge unravelled, and the storm of psychic energies began to subside. Zaharel would be overcome by the forces he tried to control, and died, only to revive many months later with the foul taint of the entity burned into his soul. By then, the rebellion would be over. Most of the Terrans on Caliban had been rounded up, and Luther would have full control over the planet. He had turned his thoughts to securing their freedom from the Imperium. However, there was disunity amongst his followers, as Lord Cypher acted to protect his position of influence over the saviour of Caliban and the preeminence of the traditionalists. Following his recovery, Zaharel would disappear while on a new mission, and some of the librarians under his command would speculate that Lord Cypher had murdered him to stem Luther's growing reliance on their psychic talents. The Master Magus had left on a mission with Lord Cypher by the special command of Luther. Their psychic trail leaded into the North Wilds, and while both men entered, only one departed. In the ritual attempting to follow the psychic trail, the librarians would be confronted by Lord Cypher both in their vision and in person. He questioned their actions in seeking Zaharel rather than following the orders to contact the warp craft that were approaching the system. In turn, they questioned how Lord Cypher could have blocked their projection when he was not a psyker himself. Cypher would reveal the power was borrowed, but before they could ask from where, the truth was revealed, as six diminutive figures clad in deep robes appeared from the shadows, the Watchers in the Dark. Unnerved, the librarians agreed to cease their search and return to the rock with Cypher. Unbeknownst to them all, Zaharel was not only alive, but he emerged back onto the surface of Caliban once more, invigorated by new truths. He had thought the Ouroboros was an enemy, devouring Caliban from within. Now he believed the Ouroboros was Caliban, its soul, and he allowed its power to flow into him, a serpent of energy rising from the depths to carry him speeding towards Alderuk, and a reckoning with the man who had left him for dead. On reuniting with his fellow librarian, Zaharel would reveal that Cypher left him to die deep below the North Wilds. His desire for vengeance was put on hold when he was informed that the Watchers in the Dark were providing the Master of Mysteries their aid. Their power could not be underestimated. When Luther called together Zaharel, Lord Cypher, and the new First Master, Astalon, his growing paranoia was clear. Cypher expected his treachery to be exposed but was surprised to find that Zaharel had instead told how he'd urged the Master of Mysteries to leave him behind when the Arcology collapsed. The warships approaching Caliban would be emissaries from their own legion, led by Chapter Master Belath, and soon Luther's betrayal of their Primarch would be revealed. 
Balath's suspicions were raised by the devastation he observed at the Northwild's arcology, but more pressing matters were at hand. Belath told how Horus had succeeded in the near destruction of the Salamander's Raven Guard and Iron Hands, how the Gorgon had been slain at Fulgrim's hand on Istvan V, as the Night Lords, word bearers and Iron Warriors revealed they had sided with the traitors. They also learned that the Lion had split the Legion following his duel with Conrad Kurz, leaving Corswain to battle elements of the Death Guard, while he travelled beyond the Ruin Storm to Ultramar, where Rebute Gilliman was gathering his strength. Seemingly, the two Primarchs believed Terra had fallen, and the Emperor was slain at Horus's hand. It was Corswain that dispatched Belath to Caliban with orders to bring more warriors to the campaign. Luther would confirm that recruits were ready, but how could he be sure that Belath remained loyal? He would need to ponder his request, and in the meantime Belath and his returning brothers would be honoured, as was the way of the Knights of the Order, with a feast. In private, Astalan was quick to assert that the chapter master needed to die, but Lord Cypher pointed out that Belath and most of his companions were sons of Caliban, and they may not be opposed to their purposes and they may not be opposed to their ambitions. Cypher guided Luther to conclude that both sides would likely exhaust themselves in the conflict raging across the galaxy, and Caliban would be strong enough to stand alone if they kept the warriors Balath was demanding. He reinforced the point by saying if the Order was to stand, then those who called themselves Dark Angels were outsiders, tools of terror, and enemies to their cause. Lord Cypher was tasked with speaking with Balath, and as many of the Calibanite emissaries under his command as he could, to find those who might be open to their point of view. He was hesitant, believing it an unnecessary complication. At the feast, Lord Cypher had ensured that the outcome of his discussions with the members of the returning force were clear, with golden goblets marking out those who would likely join their cause, while those who would likely resist were given silver. Events would be accelerated when Balath received a report that Astalan was commandeering the ships in orbit, and while Luther would be genuinely surprised by the actions of his second-in-command, he would not be swayed from making his speech to the assembled Astartes. It was time, he said, for Caliban to be liberated from the yoke of the Imperium. Their world had been ravaged in the name of terror, their ancient traditions washed away by the Imperial truth and their noble history overwritten with propaganda and lies. He would not follow Horus, but the Emperor was a tyrant unworthy of their loyalty too. He brought up the burning of Prospero by the Space Wolves, and asked if Caliban would face a similar fate at the hands of the Hounds of Fenris. Luther claimed the Lion had abandoned Caliban to its fate, while he raised a new empire alongside his brother and his powerful speech was close to swaying all the Astartes in the hall. Zaharel saw a future, where Balath would join the ruling council headed by Luther and advised by Lord Cypher, and the Order would be truly united. But the Orberus, but the Orberus that now tainted his soul needed conflict and strife. These would be quashed under Luther's vision, and he would have to act now to prevent it. Claiming a vision of assassination, Zaharel would send a bolt of green lightning into Balath, cracking open his war plate and sending his lifeless body skidding across the flags of the hall, and the sons of Caliban turned on each other. In the midst of the carnage, Zaharel had a vision of Cypher raising his plasma pistol and sending a deadly bolt into his exposed back. He was not alone in foreseeing this treachery, and a fellow librarian threw himself in front of the deadly plasma bolt. His full intent revealed, Lord Cypher retreated, pursued by Zaharel and his brothers, who were determined to reach him before he could seek Luther's protection. They would confront him beneath the Hall of Decimal, but once again the Watchers in the Dark would reveal their presence. This time several dozen pairs of scarlet eyes blazing with power surrounded them. Speaking through Lord Cypher, they warned Zaharel that he was not serving Caliban as he believed. The Ouroboros was an invader, not the soul of Caliban. But Zaharel would not believe their words, and sent a sheet of flame in the direction of the voice. 
When Lord Cypher next struck Zaharel saw not an Astartes, but a man garbed in a robe of bark and leaves, a tree given human form. More than a tree, a whole forest. The green man implored Zaharel to renounce his false master and pledge himself to the Order, but he would not be swayed. He accused the Watchers of manipulating the Order from the beginning, and he would no longer be an unwitting servant of the Xenos. Zaharel rose and banished the vision, rendering Lord Cypher back to his mortal form. The Guardian of the Order renewed his attack, but he could not penetrate the aura of energy that surrounded the Librarian. The Ouroboros besieged Zaharel to set it free, and he demanded the Watchers leave or he would unleash the Conqueror Worm to devour them all. The Watchers abandoned Lord Cypher to his fate. Summoning the energies of Caliban once more, Zaharel turned Cypher's sword to rust and sent forth tendrils of green power to rip the mask from his helm. On recognizing the face that was revealed beneath, Zaharel would claim it was a secret well kept, before sending psychic power scything through Cypher's legs, shattering the bone within the flesh. The last words of Lord Cypher would be to curse Zaharel that he had damned himself and all of Caliban, and that he knew nothing of the price of chaos. Zaharel simply turned away and ordered his men to ensure the body was not found. With the die cast on Caliban, Luther would seek not only to consolidate his grip on the forces of the home world, but expand his base of power further. Unbeknownst to him, events in the Imperium Secundus would soon lead to the return of the Lion to Caliban. Luther rallied the Legion forces and proclaimed the Order had been returned, and with it Caliban's honor. To bring them guidance, he presented the new Lord Cypher, as Zaharel pulled down the Iron Mask beneath his hood. What happened to Zaharel after his promotion to Lord Cypher is unknown, as is the exact identity of the man he replaced, although we do have a clue in one of Luther's later ravings. What is certain is that when Lionel Johnson returned to Caliban, racked with grief over the fate of the Emperor, his fleet was unprepared to be greeted by a savage salvo of fire from the surface. He learnt that Luther had seized control of the planet and turned his back on the Imperium in what the Lion could only assume was a fall to the powers of chaos that had corrupted so many of his brothers and their legions. The Primarch's fury was unbridled, and he unleashed a systematic bombardment of the planet that left most of it a devastated ruin. Once most of the planet's defenses were destroyed, Johnson led his forces personally against the remaining rebels that had sought refuge in Alderok. The Lion confronted his former friend, who was now greatly empowered by chaotic energy and the two fought a titanic duel that would level most of the fortress monastery to the ground, while the very planet itself began to tear apart. It is believed that the battle between Luther and his Primarch ended when the wounded saviour of Caliban unleashed a terrible psychic assault against the lion, leaving him clinging to life. Looking down at the fallen lion, it is said that it was as if a veil had been lifted from Luther's eyes, and appalled at what he had done, he sank down to his knees as grief overcame him. A massive warp storm built above Caliban, and the planet itself was torn apart, leaving only the vast monastery that was protected by its void shields intact. When the remaining Dark Angels descended to what was now an asteroid to search for their Primarch, they found Luther raving that the Lion had been taken by the Watchers. Of Luther's remaining forces, there was also no trace. They had been drawn into the warp and scattered throughout the galaxy. The surviving Dark Angels grieved for their lost homeworld and Primarch, and felt there was no choice but to hide the truth of their brother's betrayal for fear of being declared excommunicate traitorous. It was decreed that no outsider must learn the dreadful truth. In the wake of the fall of Caliban, the Dark Angels immersed themselves in the war known as the Great Scouring against what remained of the traitor legions. The remains of Alderok would become the new headquarters for the Dark Angels, and eventually the Rock, as it was more simply known, was outfitted with warp engines, allowing it to reach to span the galaxy. 
At first, the Dark Angels believed that all their traitorous brethren had been destroyed at the fall of Caliban, but in time their librarians detected the psychic signatures of their lost brothers. The traitors now known as the Fallen Angels, or just the Fallen, had not been destroyed when they were sucked into the warp. Instead, they had been cast across time and space, and many of the traitors had returned, scattered across the galaxy, but they had not yet recognized the one who bore the title, Lord Cypher. That the Fallen had escaped vengeance was a torment for the surviving Dark Angels. As long as the Fallen lived, the Legion's great shame would live on, and their secret could be revealed. As the warp does not follow the material world's laws of time and space, some of the Fallen reappeared moments after the destruction of Caliban, others thousands of years in the future. Some succumbed to the gods of chaos, some were driven mad by their exposure to the warp, others only broke upon their return. As the Fallen were scattered as individuals or small groups across the Imperium, they riddled the vast realm of mankind, ready to sow further betrayal. Many formed their own warbands, cults, and even armies. Some rose to rule over planetary empires, while others sought immediate revenge against the Imperium. Ominously for the Dark Angels, they raved aloud of those secrets the Sons of the Lion had sworn to keep silent. Caliban's fate only strengthening their belief that the Emperor was a tyrant. Some fallen were not corrupted, and became cognizant of how Luther had led them astray. Once cast back into the galaxy, these individuals attempted to find a place in human society. Some even sought a form of redemption. The subsequent actions of the fallen are irrelevant in the eyes of the Dark Angels, who believe that all the fallen must be found and made to repent. While a single member of the Fallen remains alive and unrepentant, the Dark Angels will refer to themselves and their successors as the Unforgiven. In the aftermath of the Heresy, the Dark Angels mostly complied with the strictures of the Codex Astartes. They also took advantage of this period of upheaval to hide the dark truth of Caliban's fall. There was also another matter they wished to keep from being uncovered, the loss of one of their second founding chapters, the Lion's Sable in the Forgotten Wars, and one of their first encounters with the Fallen they have hunted ever since, the one now known simply as Cypher. While in pursuit of the remnants of an Orc fleet in the Gothic Sector, long-range scans by the Angels of Vengeance uncovered an encrypted signal beamed from the mining world of Lemnos. Lemnos was embroiled in a bitter civil war over mining rights, but as Imperial tithes were being met, the matter was left for the planetary governor to handle. The mysterious message was sent in one of the older battle codes used by the Dark Angels, and provided just the sort of clues that fit the modus operandi of one of the Fallen. It seemed the leader of one of the mercenary warbands fighting on Lemnos was turning the tide of battle almost single-handedly. He also fought in what appeared to be an old mark of power armor. At close ranges, librarians from the Unforgiven chapters can pick up the unique psychic signatures of those who bear traces of their shared Primark, and on Lemnos, the librarians reported multiple readings. The original target, a towering man known as the Mauler, gave those telltale signs, and Terminators from the Angels of Vengeance First Company were sent in to apprehend him. There were, however, other readings picked up from the vicinity as well. One of these signals flickered, the first recorded encounter, with the unique signals that would later be associated with Cypher. The strike team suffered high casualties, but was successful in capturing the Mauler, although there was one amongst his warband who shot his way out. At the time, neither the robed stranger, his unusually lethal pistol shots, nor his subsequent escape and disappearance were the calling cards they have since become. The Mauler was secured in the Dungeons of the Rock, and under the harsh methods of the interrogator chaplains and mind probes of the librarians, he revealed he had once been known as Brother Stytrix. Before recanting and being granted the release of death, Stytrix revealed more. He named a dozen of the Fallen operating in the Sector, and members of the Dark Angels and their successors the Angels of Vengeance, and the ill-fated Lion Sable followed these trails. With each new scrap of information, a larger and more sinister plot was slowly uncovered. A corruption spread through six systems of the Gothic Sector, 
a coherent and sinister thread that bore many of the hallmarks of an elaborate plot by the Alpha Legion, although at that time, the Inquisition believed that Legion destroyed. Weaving through the clues and crisscrossing trail of evidence scattered across the Gothic sector, the name of Cypher became a fast-growing obsession. At times, the cowled figure produced the psychic signature of a fallen, but at others, the librarians could detect nothing save for a brief flickering of the signal, as if it were overtaken by some other being. There was more, a hollow, null void, a cold emptiness that moved through the immaterium like a shadow left behind. The pursuit of Cypher stretched from years into decades, until it came to the densely populated world of Brigia. The commander of the planetary defense force there, Grand Captain Tylius, was most likely a member of the Fallen, and he had been in recent contact with Cypher. The Grand Captain was already wary, and remained within Brigia's most formidable fortress system, an entire army acting as his personal bodyguard. Person, the Supreme Grand Master of the Dark Angels, gathered all the Unforgiven within range to strike, and both the Angels of Redemption and the Lion's Sable answered the summons. With precision timing and deadly accuracy, the Unforgiven made headway through the fortress's outermost defences, working their way inwards, and were poised for a final attack on the central keep, where Tylius was hidden, when a new target of opportunity appeared on the battlefield, Cypher. Having been frustrated in their hunt for so long, all efforts shifted from defeating Tylius' forces to apprehending Cypher. His appearance drew in Person's Terminator reserves as they teleported in in an attempt to surround their quarry. Tylius was a cunning tactician, however, and he chose this moment to release a large reserve force of traitor Terminators teleported to aid his fortress defense while mobs of cultists were called up from nearby population centers. He was indeed a fallen, and he had immersed himself in a labyrinthine Alpha Legion scheme. Cypher moved across the battlefield with speed and surety, and again and again the Unforgiven flushed out their prize in the midst of the raging conflagration all around them. With his twin pistols, the robed warrior blasted a hole through the defenders of Brigia, and kept just ahead of his pursuers until he reached a blast door leading to an underground complex below. Before the nearest squad of Deathwing could reach him, the Chaos Terminators launched their counter-attack, and soon the Unforgiven were too hard-pressed to follow. Although they were victorious, by the time they assaulted the final stronghold, Cypher and Tylius had made good their escape. The events on Brigia established that the Fallen would ally with those legions who fell during the heresy, and it was no surprise when the clues that had been leading the Unforgiven across the Gothic Sector now led towards the Eye of Terror itself, and specifically the outermost twin planets of Cositus 1 and 2. To travel too close to the Eye of Terror was forbidden by the Imperium, and defences surrounding the Rent in reality would make it difficult to enter without being observed. Furthermore, after Brigia, several Inquisitors had already been dispatched to look into the reported presence of the despised Alpha Legion. Supreme Grandmaster Person agreed to send a task force into the swirling mists at the edge of the Eye of Terror, a single-strike cruiser belonging to the Lion's Sable to immediately make planet fall at the site of the last signal transmission. On the mist-shrouded planet, they discovered a fortress stronghold clad in plasteel and adamantium. The walls and ramparts bristled with weapons, and the great tower bore the unmistakable icons of the Dark Angels. However, this stronghold was no tribute. It was in mockery, a tower of fallen angels. When it was reported that the distinct signal of Cypher was on the planet, Supreme Grandmaster Person gave both the order to attack and the command that sent a second ship. So began the Forgotten Wars, a raging battle upon Cocytus I that drew in half the Dark Angels and the Angels of Redemption, three companies of the Angels of Vengeance, and the entire chapter of the Lion's Sable. Battle raged as the Unforgiven raised den after den of renegades, pressing ever more deeply into the wasteland continents of both planets. Twice Cypher eluded them, but more infuriating were the messages he left urging them to depart, and warning them they were heading into a trap. 
Begrudgingly, Person had to admit it looked as if the warnings were true. He gave the command to retreat as warp storms crashed over the region. The Lion Sable, however, refused, much as the Dark Angel's Primarch had stubbornly held on to his position or refused to give grounds in the days he led his legion. Taking with him only his bodyguard, the Supreme Grand Master headed back down to the planet and commanded the fleet to get clear. That was the last that anyone would ever see of Person or the Lion Sable. Those who survived to bring word of these events back to the rock, found that although they had been gone for the span of a few years as measured inside the storms, in real space over a thousand years had passed. When the tempest ceased, no sign of the twin planets could be found. Cypher, however, did return, his distinctive trace appearing in the same system as the rock, which scrambled hunt teams to seek him. Once again, he eluded them, but not before leading them into a desolate cathedral to the Emperor on a ruined and desolate planet. There they found neatly placed the Sword of Secrets and the Lion Helm, the icons of the Dark Angels, formerly carried by their Supreme Grand Master. This would just be the first instance of Cypher aiding the Dark Angels that hunt him relentlessly. Another occurred during the Battle of Vermalak Prime in 822M33, the final confrontation of the Red Stars campaign. In the Kolgotha system, the entire Dark Angels were deployed against an Orc War of war boss Zograx the Great. It was hoped the Deathwing could draw out and slay the war boss before the marines were overwhelmed by the rising green tide. Alas, Zograx mechs deployed a jamming device that prevented the Deathwing from teleporting anywhere near his vicinity. Defiant, Supreme Grandmaster Aloken led his own command squad and the Third Company in an attempt to cut through the war boss's bodyguard. However, the mega-armoured knobs were supported by many hulking, mechanised fighting machines and proved too powerful. By the time Alakan appeared before the chain-axe-wielding orc warboss, his force was all but spent. Zograx was a formidable foe, and the Supreme Grand Master was cut down. But as the hulking orc reached to claim the lion's helm for his prize, his hand was vaporised by a bolt of plasma. Howling in anger and surprise, the towering orc warboss would take a rapid volley of bolt pistols through both his good eye and the bionically enhanced one. Cypher appeared, spinning in a circle while his twin guns blazed away, plasma pistol melting holes through mega armor, while bolter shells struck at the joints and open-faced helms. Cypher then dragged Alakan, still bearing the chapter artifact, to a nearby trench, and made his escape while the Dark Angels closed in and the First Company arrived to secure victory. Of Cypher, no further signs could be found. The title of Supreme Grand Master would be passed on to Mordoran, and he would later release Luther from stasis to consult him about Cypher. Luther would urge caution in pursuit of the Master of Mysteries. Mordoran would misinterpret Luther's warning, and in attempting to capture Cypher once more, his actions led to the near destruction of the chapter. In despair at his reckless actions, Mordoran would take his own life in Luther's cell on his return to the Rock. Across the galaxy, Cypher continues to cross paths with the Dark Angels, but it is often under the guise of another that attention is first drawn to his presence. Whether he actually assumes these aliases, or if his presence has merely begun another series of rumours is another mystery. In 997M33, under the guise of the saviour of Prexus, he was found to be manipulating the recruiting process of the Angels of Redemption by hand-selecting and training the feral warriors there to increase their chances of being chosen. When Cypher arrives upon a planet, he has the proven ability to persuade and cajole the disaffected masses into rebellion. In 257M53, successionists of the Ur Council of Nova Terra declared themselves independent. In the guise of the robed rogue, Cypher weaved through the anarchy, his trail highlighting the many fallen that had taken positions of power during the uprising in the Segmentum Pacificus. During the Age of Apostasy, the Red Heresy Plague of 290-310M36 erupted across the Doloth Sector, a foreshadowing of the later battles that would become known as the Plague of Unbelief. In the Segmentum Tempestus, the cult of the Old Gods arose in the densely populated sector, 
Agitators and anarchists stirred the hives into open rebellion, and by the urging of the red robe priests, Adeptus Ministarum and Ministorum officials were slaughtered. These crimes drew an armed response from the Imperium that included the Silver Skulls chapter, but attempts to kill the leaders behind the uprising proved disastrous. Only the arrival of the Dark Angels and the Third Company of the Angels of Vengeance staved off certain defeat. However, the Silver Skulls observed the Deathwing forsaking the battle, in pursuit of a mysterious robe Astartes. Before Cypher escaped, an Angels of Vengeance librarian detected several fallen ensconced within the red-robed hierarchy of the Red Heresy. The Silver Skulls were able to carry the day, but openly condemned the Dark Angels, and a formal protest was filed with the High Lords of Terror. His next notable action would be as the leader of the Zaragosian smuggler fleet that perpetrated a number of raids amidst the sprawling asteroid fields and man-made platforms of the Black Gulf Mines around 154 M37. It was reported that a cloaked stranger had fought their way onto the smuggler black ship the Black Needle. It was reported that a cloaked stranger had fought his way onto the smuggler flagship the Black Needle, invoked the right of combat to take the place of one of the crew, and quickly rose to overthrow the previous captain. The series of raids under his leadership drew the attention of the Dark Angels, and although the smuggler evaded capture, they were alerted once again to another member of the Fallen the leader of an entire mining colony known as the Black Gulf Tyrant. Despite the apparently obvious aid the one known as Cypher has given his former brothers since the fall of Caliban, it did not stop the Supreme Grandmaster Anaziel making a special request of the High Lords of Terror to raise a new chapter in the 37th millennium, with their secret sole purpose being to hunt down the Lord of the Fallen. This highly mobile faction was named the Disciples of Caliban, and the purest gene seed available to the Dark Angels was used in their creation. Despite the best efforts of his former brothers to keep his identity a secret, there have been incidents where Cypher has attracted the attention of the Inquisition. He is known to have once subverted an inquisitorial death squad for his own purposes. In 665 M38, while on a secret mission, Inquisitor Andalus, who wore a cowl to cover his hideous injuries, was supplanted by Cypher, who acted in his stead. After using his new guise to destroy many sensitive records pertaining to both himself and the Unforgiven chapters, Cypher took control of his web of agents and misdirected the defense of Septius Seven, resulting in the complete collapse of an Imperial Hive world. While the planetary governor and ruling caste was corrupt and unjust, he was the rightful ruler, and the planet's tithes had always been honored. For over 300 years during the 39th millennium, Cypher remained in eye space. There, he made contact with various groups of fallen, and further alliances with the traitor legions, in particular the Alpha Legion. However, by 518, he appears to have grown tired of the devious ways of the 20th Legion, and takes a measure of revenge by leading his former brothers into the path of the priest Aldric, the Subverter. Aldric had, through meticulous planning on behalf of his Alpha Legion allies, led a host of planets on the borders of the Veiled Region to reject the rule of the Imperium in what was known as the Hundred Planet Rebellion. Within a decade, the Dark Angels and several of their successor chapters suppressed the Chaos Cultist uprisings and slayed their leaders. The pursuit of their elusive quarry would lead to the downfall of another Supreme Grand Master, when in 939 M41, while on the trail of Cypher, Commander Nabarius would be led into an ambush and slain by a Chaos Space Marine warband. Grand Master Azriel leads his Death Wing to recover his body, and ended the conflict, now known as the Ramiel Betrayal. While Cypher eluded capture once more, Azriel's deeds, in both this action and others, would see him named successor and current Supreme Grand Master of the First Legion. There is some disparity in certain records around when Azriel assumed his position, but these could easily be another example of the Dark Angel's desire for secrecy in all matters concerning Cypher and the Fallen. 
Trailing the Master of Mysteries would lead the Dark Angels to uncover a number of corrupt Chaos cults, instigated by the Alpha Legion during the spate of civil uprisings known as the Makarian Heresy of 405 M41 that occurred in territories gained by the Imperium during the Makarian Crusade of Lord Solar Makarius. A number of fallen were also identified during these actions, but a clash with the Space Wolves prevented their capture. Cypher would again disappear for some time, before resurfacing in 976 M41, during the final battle of the conflict known as the Liberation of Amadus. Hugely outnumbered by Chaos cultists who were well supported by artillery, Cypher appeared to rally the overwhelmed planetary defenders, which included the Procell First Irregulars, and against all odds they fought off waves of assaults. Cypher would then make an enemy of the Red Corsairs during the Escovan campaign of 989 M41, when after a series of bloody battles, they felt he had betrayed them. Many years later, the Red Corsairs thought they had finally captured Cypher aboard a strike cruiser, yet when the heretic Astartes pirates boarded the vessel, they found only cultists, who would die to the last, refusing to reveal Cypher's whereabouts, or how he had escaped. After millennia of evading capture, Cypher would make a surprising turn on the world of Tharsis, in the ruins of the fortress known as the Slaughter Keep, when he would present himself directly and surrender to a force of Black Knights. Saving one of their number by slaying an Astartes they believed at the time to be Astalan, Luther's second in command during the fall of Caliban. He then demanded to be taken to their superiors. Cypher relinquished his ancient plasma and bolt pistols as he surrendered, but would not part with the great longsword he had strapped across his back. He would be taken to interrogate a chaplain Asmodai, who would be suspicious that the architect of so many fallen plots would surrender into their custody so willingly even more so when he realised the slain Fallen was indeed not Astalan, and their true target had escaped. Cypher told the chaplain it was imperative he see the Supreme Grand Master to avert a great catastrophe that would come if the plans of a captured traitor known as Anaval would come to pass. Chaplain Asmodai would question if this Dartes before him was even the one they knew as Cypher, until the Lord of the Fallen uttered the word Starfire the command code uttered by Astalan that activated Caliban's defensive grid to open fire upon the lion. Asmodai would consult with Grand Master Belial and his fellow chaplain Saphorn, the Master of Sanctity, about Cypher's surrender and desire to speak with Azrael. They would agree that Cypher's excruciation and repentance, along with the secrets he could reveal, would be an unparalleled achievement and vital for the future success of the hunt for the other fallen. Despite this, they could not ignore his claims of a direct threat to the chapter, and agreed to consult with the rest of the inner circle. While clearing the last of the resistance on the surface of Tharsis, a fierce battle still raged in orbit, during which a departing renegade battleship was identified as the Terminus Est, flagship of the despised traitor legionary Typhus. Asmodai would take Cypher to Grand Master Belal, the Deathwing commander, However, he was unprepared for Balal to immediately draw his blade, the Sword of Silence, and make to execute Cypher on the spot. The interrogator chaplain had mere fractions of a second to react, and only managed to deflect the Grand Master's blow by sacrificing his own hand in an attempt to grasp the blade. In his conflicted rage, Balal would warn it was too dangerous to allow Cypher to live, that he would bend their thoughts to his will and manipulate them. Seeing there was no way to get through to the enraged Grand Master, Asmodai was forced to use the verbal trigger implanted in the minds of every Dark Angel since the fall of Caliban to incapacitate him. When Cypher was next released from his status cell, it was to be taken alongside Anovel to be presented to Azrael at the Rock. Azrael had decided the chapter would move on to battle the emerging threat of a Varsene blood flock 70 light years away. Anovel and Cypher were marched into the Dungeons of the Rock, to the chamber just below the great library where candidates for the inner circle were tested. In the shadows at the edge of the chamber, he saw diminutive figures, no taller than waist high, swathed in dark robes that hid any sight from within, eyes gleaming like embers beneath their cowls. The watchers in the dark had returned. Azrael told his commanders that the first inner circle consisted of twelve grandmasters, 
the chapter master of the Dark Angels and his peers from the eleven successors of the time, and that first enclave was drawn together to pursue the fallen with all vigor and secrecy. Azrael would share these secrets as he firmly believed Cypher held the key to their salvation and their damnation. He would also reveal this was not the first time Cypher had been captured, and it was this that caused the first conclave of the Inner Circle to gather. The Lord of the Fallen had presented himself and demanded an audience with the Lords of the Chapter. A further six times he had been in their custody, yet each time he escaped without retribution for his betrayals. Azrael related everything he had learned about Cypher from the ledgers of the Chapter Masters, but even those records were woefully incomplete. Despite clear opportunities to subject Cypher to excruciation at the hands of the interrogators, Azriel's predecessors had seemingly failed to do so. Of the seven previous occasions of his incarceration, four had resulted from the rebel presenting himself to his captors. The three remaining circumstances were vague, but Azriel suspected these two had been arranged by Cypher. Similarly, the reports were unclear on the manner of his departure, but Cypher had found freedom seven times before. The only other theme connecting these encounters was their timing. Every appearance of Cypher happened just before a pivotal moment in the chapter's history, the eve of a great victory or defeat. Azriel would finally grant Cypher an audience. The Lord of the Fallen would tell him there was more to the plotting of Astalan, Methalus, and Typhus than it seemed, and that for once it was he who had been deceived by his allies. Cypher admitted it was he who led the attack on the Chapter Keep on Pristina IV, and claimed Mathalus and Anoval had unleashed the Life Eater virus without his knowledge. Cypher claimed his role was to obtain and supply the gene seed that would form a basis of a new generation of legionaries. Astalan was to seize Tharsis, and this was to be the new homeworld of the new legion, combining the traits of the Dark Angels and Death Guard, using the expertise of Fabius Bile. He would go on to claim that Anoval had betrayed their alliance to secure leadership of the new force for himself, and that he was going to take Typhus and these new legionaries to the Caliban system, but for what purpose he did not know. Cypher assured Azriel that he could help turn Anoval, and while the Lord of the Rock was hesitant, his chief librarian Ezekiel assured him he could sense no falseness in Cypher's mind, and should allow the meeting. When Chaplain Saffon began confronting Anoval, the revelation of Cypher's capture unsettled the fallen apothecary, as did the litany of facts the chaplains Ravenwing and Deathwing had unearthed in the last year about their plot. When Cypher was brought into the chamber, Anovel heaved at his bonds in desperation before falling to his knees. The two renegades looked at each other, and Anovel's expression changed from anguish to one of resignation. He pushed himself to his feet with a surge, a loud cracking as muscles railed against chain, snapping the bones in his wrists and hands so that they slipped free. In turn, Cypher twisted, dodging the grasp of the knights that held him, and with a deft movement, looped the chain of his manacles over Anovel's head, and twisted his body, lifting the other fallen from his feet over his shoulder, and breaking his spine. In the conclave of his inner circle that would follow, the conclusion would be raised that Cypher had presented himself to them with the aim of silencing the fallen apothecary, but that his warning about a threat to the chapter could be truthful. Dissenting voices called for an end to following the lies of Cypher, and they should not be diverted from their present course. The Lord of the Fallen would be forced to reveal his secrets by means of excruciation like any other captured Fallen, and in the end this view prevailed. Interrogator Chaplain Asmodai would conduct the excruciation of Cypher, who suffered the blows and cuts inflicted upon him while he simply laid upon the slab and stared off into some faraway place in his mind. No questions were asked, and if there was any expression on Cypher's face it was sorrow, a profound sadness in his eyes, brought about by whatever imagined vista he looked upon rather than his current plight. Perhaps he felt he had no more left to lose, nothing worth defending. Perhaps he believed the punishment was deserved, or maybe his stoic manner stemmed from a confidence he would endure and eventually escape his captors. What was certain was an unprecedented event occurred. In a dark corner of the cell, a pair of glowing red eyes had appeared. Never before had a watcher shown any interest in an excruciation. Chaplain Saffon would enter the cell next, and Cypher would offer an apology, 
showing genuine contrition for killing Anovel before inviting Asmodar to re-enter to hear what he had to say. Cypher would name the planet of Perteus, and claim it held the key to Horus's defeat and the salvation of the Dark Angels. While the two chaplains were convinced of the need of the fleet to change course, they were unable to find support without the word of the Lord of the Rock, and they beseeched Azrael to at least hear Cypher's claims for himself, before electing which course of action to take. In that meeting, the Lord of the Fallen would empathise with Azrael's doubts, and would even appear to show honest and earnest admiration for the Supreme Grand Master, and say any shame he carried for his actions in the cause of the hunt was misplaced. Azrael would ask how Cypher intended to escape on this occasion, to which his reply was he intended to leave the same way he had left the company of the seven prior Supreme Grand Masters, with his permission. And so Cypher would continue, reminding Azrael it was not only the traitor legions that joined Horus during the dark days of the heresy, there were others within the loyalist legions that betrayed their oaths to their brothers Primarch and the Emperor. While Azrael would contest this did not compare to the crimes of the Fallen, he did concede this was true. Cypher would continue that the other legions were of no mind to conceal the treachery and their ranks, and some even used it to reinforce their dedication to the Emperor, but the Dark Angels chose the path of secrecy and lies, and this became their crime. He went on to say that the second lie was when he returned to warn that the Fallen were not dead, and that some were honourable men who had been led astray. He'd hoped for openness, but instead found distrust and fear. Despite this, Cypher agreed that should the truth come to light now, both the Dark Angels and the Imperium would suffer, and he would save both from that fate. He then bid Azrael to open the door of the cell, and in doing so he was confronted by the glinting red eyes of over thirty Watchers in the dark. Azrael felt the sense of dislocation, and suddenly ahead was a great door, and Cypher was at his shoulder, freed from his bonds. The portal led to a huge cathedral-like space, the walls covered in stacks of machinery and monitors joined by coils of cables and pipes. However, their eyes were drawn to the centre of the chamber, where there was a perfect sphere of marbled black with flecks of gold that moved slowly across its surface. The mysterious object emanated an obvious sentence. Chief Librarian Ezekiel was also summoned to the chamber by the Watchers, and he would confirm the sphere was connected to the warp and could sense their presence, but he could penetrate its mysteries no further. It was then that Azrael noticed the corpse of an ancient man almost completely hidden amongst the tangle of cables on the floor. As he watched, the dead man's chest began to rise and fall, and the frail body twitched and then sat up in jerky motions. Cypher revealed the object to be called Tukulcha, and it had been imprisoned there since the days of the heresy when it had been pivotal to the Legion. He also warned it was evil and thrived on turmoil and bloodshed. Tukulcha would speak through its ancient servitor to Azrael directly, claiming that all covered it, including the one they called Typhus. Cypher guessed it had been held deep in the rock out of fear it would fall into the wrong hands. Tukulcha said the only way to be rid of it was to take it home, to Caliban. When Ezekiel told it Caliban was no more, its answer was simple. It didn't have to be. With its aid, their homeworld could be saved, and so could the lion. Ezekiel sensed that they were no longer in the warp. The whole fleet had been moved into real space by the mysterious sphere. Not only that, but they appeared to have been transported through a swift running current through the warp, and they had now exited deep inside the Caliban system. Several other warships were also present, some from the Consecrator's chapter, but others unidentified and presumed hostile, heading towards the former location of the Dark Angel's home world. Among the unidentified ships were between five and seven capital-class ships, and one had energy outputs that identified it as the Terminus Est, the plague ship of Typhus. On the advance of the Dark Angels, Typhus's fleet pulled back, and Azrael received a hail from Grand Master Nakia, Chapter Master of the Consecrators. Azrael extended the invitation to join him on the rock, alongside Chapter Master Dane of the Knights of the Crimson Order, although he stressed there was no need to mention Cypher or to culture. As the fleet made its way slowly to the Caliban nominal point, Azrael wrestled with balancing the future of his chapter and the impact on the Imperium should the true legacy of Caliban be revealed. As they advanced, the Terminus Est and the rest of Typhus's plague fleet withdrew, but it was clear the traitor commander had no intention of leaving the system. 
Over 10,000 years, the asteroid remains of ancient Caliban had spread along the planet's former orbit, creating a dense field containing tens of thousands of pieces of planetary debris and a cloud of dust and gas that extended for several thousand kilometers further. While hosting the other chapter masters, Azriel received a report that the enemy fleet had changed course and was now heading directly towards them. That was not all. Ezekiel informed the Lord of the Rock that Tukulcha had psychically warned him that nearly 30 other ships were in the Immaterium close to Caliban, shrouded by a warp spell. Before long, a massive interspatial tear appeared, the prismatic energy of the warp ripping through reality in a multicolored blaze. Silhouettes wavered in the brightness, casting long shadows into the real universe that blotted out the stars. The gash lengthened and widened, as though invisible fingers pried open the edges. Ezekiel warned that something on the Terminus Est was acting as a bridge between here and the warp. To culture acted as a lens once more, and through Ezekiel's eyes, Azriel saw a flicker of reflection. An immensely bloated demonic creature, with several dozen fanged maws and a thousand eyes. Yet beyond the demon, inside its immaterial form, he saw a vast worm coiled about the core of the demon, feeding on its own tail. The shadows in the rift resolved into the crude shapes of warships that poured from the breach in two lines astern. Some looked normal, but most were bizarre conglomerations of starship and warp matter, vessels mutated by demonic possession. The largest of these, a black star of filth-encrusted stone and metal in a perverse mockery of the rock. Asriel ordered all ships to engage the new threat, and placed Nakia in command of the fleet, as he ordered Cypher brought with them as they went to meet to culture once more. The second wave of renegade ships were circumnavigating the fleet, ignoring the vessels attacking the Doomstar and its flotilla to head directly for the rock. An immense warship led this next attack, more demon city than spacefaring craft. These ships sent drop pods and other landing transports hurtling down towards the rock. One void ship was deliberately crashed down, trailing fire and debris as the rock's last line of defense turrets opened fire in a blaze of rockets and shells to no avail. It smashed into the eastern gateway. Not since the time of the Horus Heresy had any foe set foot in the hallowed halls of Alderuk. For ten millennia, the Tower of Angels, the rock, had never known the insult of invasion, but there was no gun or shield that could have stopped the suicidal impact that flattened the curtain wall for a kilometer to the south and north. Through this breach, the Death Guard advanced into a maelstrom of fire, the warped legionaries heedless of danger. While the fight for the rock continued, the Chaos Doomstar was holding position out of range, perhaps awaiting the arrival of the Terminus Est, which had broken through the joint fleet of the Dark Angels and Knights of the Crimson Order. Azriel and Ezekiel escorted Cypher to the chamber of the Tukulcha. The chapter master demanded to know what it was that Typha sought on the rock, accusing the gold-flecked globe of being a demon. Through its servitor mouthpiece, Tukulcha claimed it was something far greater, and they should cast their eye out to the abomination close at hand that had been worshipped by generations of humans to see a demon. Its latest name had been given by the people of Ulthor, the Plague Heart. Ezekiel contested there were no people found on Ulthor, but Cypher interjected they were there but unrecognizable. Shadows enslaved to the will of the Plague Heart, and damned to the eternal servitude of the Lord of Decay. Cypher said they'd been lured into a trap 10,000 years in the making, the pieces of a key brought together. He claimed not to have realized what Tukulcha truly was, a bridge between the Plague Heart and the Consumer, made to create pathways through the warp. Tukulcha again insisted they could save Caliban, save the Lion, stop the schism that had caused millennia of guilt and secrecy. Asriel questioned why Astalan, one of Luther's closest conspirators, would want to save the lion, and Cypher confirmed that the Terran renegade had nothing but hate for their Primarch, which led Asriel to conclude Astalan's true motive, to steal the Legion from the lion by saving the Fallen from his retribution and bringing them to the present. Again, it was Cypher who said he knew how to stop the foul plot, and Asriel knew this would be the moment he had predicted in their earlier meeting. 
the moment the Supreme Grand Master would let him go. Cypher revealed there was a dark core, an infectious madness in the heart of Caliban that gave rise to the Nephilim and the great beasts of old. To culture would reveal more of its origin, created by ancient beings of immense power, most likely the Old Ones, refined and shaped from the essence of chaos, used to create the webway hidden from the eyes of the ruinous powers. It looked as though Asriel would attempt to destroy to culture, but Cypher told him even if he had the means, he should not. Asriel demanded the Lord of the Fall and explain himself, and the answer was grim. To culture existed across the entirety of its timeline, divorced from the normal turn of temporal matters. If he destroyed it now, it would be destroyed in the past also. It would never have been. Cypher continued that the consequence would be the Emperor would lose the war against Horus, the lion used to culture to come to the aid of Gilliman in the Eastern Fringe, forcing the War Master into attacking Terra before the Ultramarines could arrive. Without to culture, Gilliman and his allies would be slowly destroyed, cut off by the rune storm of the word bearers. Horus could attack at full strength, and Terra would fall. Cypher claimed there was another way. The taint of Caliban was close at hand. This is why the Terminus Est and the Plague Heart were not attacking. The three elements of the ritual were being brought together. One divided into three. The bridge, the plague heart, and whatever dwelt in the core of Caliban. Reuniting, tearing open reality to conjoin the material and immaterial as it was designed to do. Cypher implored Asriel that he could stop it. That he could slay the beast of Caliban. Break one part of the triumvirate so that the other two failed. Asriel could send guards with him. Cypher just asked for his armor and the sword he carried, and a gunship. He said that by his honor, he would return. Although pained by the decision, Cypher would be released, but with an escort of black knights. Asriel would prevent their enemy interfering by striking at their leaders directly, boarding the Terminus Est and confronting Typhus and Astalon too if he was there. Cypher would be taken to awaiting Thunderhawk, to be guarded on his mission by Huntmaster Tybalain and his squad, one of whom, Anael, would pilot a Dark Talon to act as escort to the coordinates they'd been given. It was made clear that Cypher was to be protected at all costs, but not to allow him to leave their sight. Two battles now raged across the Caliban system. The combined fleet of the Unforgiven chapters cleaved towards the Terminus Est and the Plague Heart, the rock at the center of the counter-attack outnumbered the ships of the Dark Angels, and their successors pounced upon the opposing vessels scattered by the advance of the rock, eliminating each target in turn before moving on to the next. The renegades and traitors appeared unfocused. Only the ships that arrived with the Terminus Est showed any signs of coordination, withdrawing by squads to defend the massive battleship of their master. As a backdrop, the break in reality showed glimpses of an entirely different war being raged. Through the tear in the material universe could be seen an immense fleet, dozens of ships, pushed into orbit over a world of grey and green, while a ring of orbital stations hurled torpedoes and ground-based defence lasers unleashed their beams in a rough welcome. The Vox channels were filled with static through which snatches of archaic voices could be heard, their accents recognisable but barely comprehensible. Distant alarms from the other reality rang in the ears of the combatants for both sides. The surface of the rock had been all but swept of enemies, the Tower of Angels corridors and halls cleansed of the invaders. Nearly a third of the Dark Angels had been seriously wounded or slain, and out in the fleet, similar devastation was seen. The Dark Angels had been caught unawares by the arrival of the Plague Heart, but they had weathered the storm, and it was time to retaliate. Unnoticed amongst the carnage, two crafts sped into the maelstrom of rocks and debris that had been Blessed Caliban. Around them, the launch bays of the rock and the flight decks of the fleet disgorged every craft they had still capable of flight, their target, the Terminus Est. The rock turned its immense firepower onto Typhus's ship, Unable to maintain the warp rift if his battleship moved away from Caliban's nominal point, the Herald of Nurgle could not manoeuvre to evade the oncoming Dark Angels. The storm of fire from the rock intensified, until with a final blossom of energy, the last of the Terminus Est's void shield generators overloaded. As boarding torpedoes slammed into the exposed hull, and gunships blasted their way into the open launch bays of the battleship, 
The teleportaria of the rock simultaneously burst into activity, directed at the command barge of Typus's flagship, and casting the entirety of the surviving Death Wing across the warp. Meanwhile, Cypher and the Black Knights reached their destination, a tunnel system, bored into a kilometre-wide asteroid that was once part of their home world. Cypher confirmed the tunnel was once a transport system, linking the arcologies of the North Wilds with the starport at Andaril. Pushing on past glistening crystal deposits, faceted glassy beads that formed trails along the walls passing in and out of the tunnel. Cypher warned them that he was sure the entity they sought was waiting for them, but before he could give any further explanation, their auspex picked up movement ahead, but no signs of life or heat. Pulling free his pistols, he warned them to be ready for projections of the beast made real, Nephila, demon spawn. Soon the archway ahead exploded with fanged, writhing shapes as the tunnel vomited forth dozens of serpentine apparitions. When they opened fire on the worm-like creatures, they reacted as though they were a single entity, the flailing mass thrashing back into the darkness. It would prove a temporary reprieve as the floor and wall exploded, showering them in an avalanche of broken masonry as something eldritch and terrifying heaved itself into view. Neither humanoid nor slug, but some strange amalgamation of both. The visible portion of the serpentine body ended with four ribbed tentacle appendages, each tipped with half a dozen claws. Jointed limbs like those of a centipede scrambling at the ruin of the tunnel, and amongst the upper of these, a form of head that was little more than a bulge with a cluster of multifaceted eyes above a disturbingly human mouth that twisted in a grimace of displeasure. Cypher proclaimed it to be the Ouroboros, giving a name to the looming monstrosity as he fired his plasma pistol. The Black Knights soon joined him in opening fire, but their rounds appeared harmless against its blistered, cracked skin. Brother Sabrael, who bore the fabled blade of Corswain, leapt at the demon spawn, and the other Black Knights swapped pistols for Corvus hammers as Cypher stitched a line of shots across the creature's eyes. As the Black Knights were locked in deadly melee, Cypher would push past the creature's visage, disappearing into the gloom of the burrow it had created. When Anael was able to follow, he found Cypher was making his way along Ouroboros' body, revealing it was connected to a mass of pustules and warty flesh beneath the carpet of crystals on which it rested. Cypher told them they'd been fighting just one of maybe a dozen heads, and they would need to find and destroy its heart, just as violent quakes broke the asteroid apart entirely, and they were cast adrift amongst the debris. The creature formed a huge, semi-transparent ring, darker shadows of organs throbbing and elongating. The claw feet that extended along the necks unfurled strange flaps of skin, appendages for navigating through the universe of the immaterial. The Ouroboros' massive form was tipped at either end by fronds of bulbous heads like the hydras of ancient legend. Each jaw clamped around the neck of a head at the opposite end, all save the head that the Dark Angels had been fighting, which glared down at them with malign intent. It seemed to be suckling from itself, pulsing darkness flowing from one end of the immense body to the other. The beast shuddered, and its jaws opened together, freeing the cosmic demon spawn from its self-embrace. It uncoiled, darkening, flesh becoming solid. Again, Cypher repeated the need to find and destroy the heart, but not an organ of flesh and blood, the warp anchor that tethered it to reality. On the Terminus Est, while the rest of the chapter overwhelmed the lower decks, the teleporting Deathwing appeared in the Strategium. Larger than many of the halls of the rock, the ceiling held aloft by three dozen pitted pillars, the crumbling vaults above encrusted with glowing growths and fan-like fungi. On a broad dais at the far end of the chamber stood Typhus the Traveller. Tendrils that throbbed and pulsed with inner life hung from the Terminus Est, connected to his massive suit of Terminator armor in the manner of umbilical cords. Around him, the Grave Wardens were arranged in squads, bearing Reaper autocannons, combi bolters, and eclectic assortment of glaives, scythes, flails, and scimitars that burned with unholy fire. 
Of Astalin there was no sign, but the Lord of the Dark Angels did not allow this disappointment to temper his wrath. Asriel advanced on Typhus' dais. The Herald of Nurgle dwarfed him, swelled with arcane power, his armor covered with a sheen of pale green mucus that glistened on plates scabbed like torn flesh. Bony growths grew through the cracks in the plates, and his forehead was adorned with a single horn. Foul olive vapor leaked from two half-sensor breathing gills as his yellow eye lenses turned towards the mortal who dared enter his throne room. In Typhus's right hand appeared an enormous scythe, Man Reaper, and he laughed as from the holes and chimneys of his war plate spewed forth a vast cloud of flies that engulfed Azrael in a mass of squirming furry bodies and multifaceted eyes. Only his iron will and the intervention of Ezekiel allowed Azrael to escape. As Typhus and Azrael clashed, the commander of the Death Guard claimed that the Dark Angels had hidden an abomination for centuries, the key to freeing the Plague Heart, causing the breach Azrael now sought to close. The two continued to debate even as they struck and parried each other's deadly attacks, Typhus denying he had brought the Plague Heart as part of a scheme to bring forth the corrupted warriors of Caliban. Typhus countered that Caliban would die again, and at the moment of destruction the key would free the Plague Heart, just as Ezekiel warned the breach was almost upon the rock. Suddenly it was Typhus who reeled back, howling betrayal. They had all been lured there, he said, not to release the Plague Heart, nor to bring back their traitorous kin or save their Primarch from his fate. Something greater was awakening, dormant for eons, awaiting the time when it could be brought back. At that moment, the warp above the breach bucked, and suddenly dozens of warships, the successor chapters of the Dark Angels, the Unforgiven, had answered Azrael's call. To culture had brought them into the star system in the same way it had the Rock and the Knights of the Crimson Order, although why neither Azrael nor Ezekiel knew. Enraged by these events, Typhus charged with Man Reaper held high, and then in an instant, Azrael and his men were gone. To culture had acted once more, and brought the Lord of the Rock and his librarian back to its chamber. Back on the asteroid, it was becoming clear that Ouroboros' body was acting like a tether, containing the power of the warp rift opening across the Caliban system. As the huge demon spawn unfurled, the breach widened too, revealing the grey and green of their lost homeworld, its sky filled with scatterings of cloud. Cypher retreated, moving away from the beast despite his insistence the Ouroboros had to be destroyed. He was heading towards the Thunderhawk, but whether to attack or to escape was unclear. Anael had mere seconds to decide whether to follow the Lord of the Fallen, but he knew he must defeat the greater enemy in front of him. As the tattered edge of the warp breach was bleeding towards the Ouroboros, Anael saw the Thunderhawk accelerating away, answering the question of what Cypher intended. He also saw the newly arrived Unforgiven fleet attempting to trap the Chaos vessels between the rock and their angle of attack. But further on, in the second part of the Chaos fleet, the monstrous comet at its heart was glowing with power, enmeshed in a shimmering iridescent aura that Anael knew was connected to the Ouroboros' emergence. In the Hall of Tukulcha, Azrael looked around and saw that behind him were dozens of the Watchers in the Dark regarding him with glowing red eyes. Through its meat puppet servitor, Tukulcha claimed to have kept its promise. On Caliban, the Lion and Luther were about to do battle, and it asked Azrael which he would save. It was Ezekiel that saw the treachery in the Eldritch device, cleaving the servitor in twain as Azrael snarled his disbelief. The chief librarian would show his lord that another was already making to move through the opening, a pair of bright blue dots, the engines of a Thunderhawk making its way to the edge of the warp break, a ship he realized could only be piloted by Cypher. The Plague Heart was also moving, and Ezekiel sensed Astalon was on board, his thoughts of glory unfettered by the approach of victory. Asriel knew he had to block the breach. He was about to make a demand of Tukulcha, but Ezekiel stopped him and warned him there was no way to save the Lion or Caliban. All they could do was prevent Astalan bringing back a legion of fallen, or worse, the fate Typhus described becoming a reality. 
Now fully extended, the Ouroboros was hundreds of meters long, and it was descending, moving down towards the rift. Asriel gave the order for all vessels to target their rift cannons on the Caliban nominal point, in the hope to overload the tear. They had been tricked. The rock was now too far away to intervene, and the rift cannons of the other ships seemed to have little effect on the tear, and the Plague Heart was closing by the second. Aniel would take his Dark Talon and power towards the rift, overriding his instincts as much as he did the collision detection system of the vessel as he sped towards the amorphous boundary point. He had assumed Cypher was fleeing, but the Dark Talon's passive scan log showed the Thunderhawk disappearing at the edge of the warp chasm. Realising at that moment what he must do to strike at the heart, a nail hit the thruster controls, sending the Dark Talon powering into the breach. Then he disengaged the containment power fields, turning the core beneath him into an unshielded warp engine. Time slowed as he passed the threshold of the real and unreal, and he pulled the trigger of the rift cannon. A moment later, a bright star burst into life at the heart of the breach. It looked as though it might flare and die out like all the shots of the rift cannons, but it endured. After a second, it had stabilized like a shell hanging in the air. Then it started to grow. Lightning of all colors snaked across the reality tear, crackling out into the void and inwards towards Lost Caliban. The breach was feeding upon itself imploding from both directions. In the depths of the breach, Asriel could see Caliban racked by warp energy. The storm unleashed by the disintegrating warp breach crackled across the atmosphere of the world. Ships were set ablaze and orbital stations turned to dust. He watched as Caliban began breaking apart. Fronds of swirling power vomited from the closing breach, lashing at the void shields of the closest ships. And Asriel turned in desperation and ordered to culture to get everyone safely away from the breach. Seconds later, the mass translation occurred. The fleet was scattered but safe. But so too were the Plague Heart and the Terminus Est. To culture had saved them all, seeming in its own way to take pleasure in taking Asriel's command literally. Cypher had escaped once more, making it through the breach before it closed. Although Asriel contended everything they knew about him meant he would likely return, as indeed he had promised, and both he and Astalon should be considered still at large. Asriel would be proven correct, but that story and the ones that follow will be for the second part of this entry in the Imperium's Most Wanted, as we conclude a tale that takes us from Cadia to Terra and try to unravel the motives and mystery of the man of many names and titles. The Thrice Accursed, the Lord of the Fallen, the Master of Mysteries, the one simply known as Cypher. I hope you've enjoyed our journey together, and I've earned your subscription today. And I'll see you again in the near future, where there is only war.